Praise God. We're going to be looking at the last verses of Malachi this morning. Um, we've been studying Malachi for a few months, and this will probably be the last, well, almost certainly the last message on Malachi. Um, but it's a very important book, last book in the Old Testament, prelude to the coming of the Messiah. A need for the people of God to be ready for God's visitations. Next Sunday, we have a guest speaker, Jed, Pastor Jed Robbins. He's been here a few times before. Um, somebody made mention of the Jewish New Year this morning. Yesterday was Yom Teruah, the Feast of Trumpets, Rosh Hashanah, which makes today the first of the 10 days of awe. And um, Penny kind of dropped this morning, I was considering, I, th I thought this message this morning, it's not a very Rosh hashanah type message, but it is, a, it is a first day of awe type message. So I, th I think this is timely, I think this is in, in God's time actually. The, d the 10 days of awe, are the days coming up to the Day of Atonement where the people of God have a chance to repent and just get ready for their meeting with God in the Holy of Holies through the High Priest on the Day of Atonement. But I don't want to preach on that this Sunday because we'll leave that for Jed next Sunday. And he's... I've. He has a lot of experience um, in Israel, and uh, we'll let Jed preach on the feasts next Sunday. Hallelujah. I'm going to sing to you first. No, don't, don't, don't. That's all right. <coughs> it's, <laughs> it's serious, actually, but... I sense this will kind of set the tone, really, for the message. I was just singing this this morning. I thought, I think the Holy Spirit wants me just to sing this, to set the tone for what he's given me to share with you. Um, it's when I survey the wondrous cross. I'm just going to read the first two verses and just let the word sink into your heart as a preparation for what we're going to receive. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and poor contempt on all my pride. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, save in the death of Christ my God. All the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to his blood. Amen. So Malachi chapter 3, 13, and then all the way to the end of the book. This is God speaking. Your words have been harsh against me, says the Lord. Yet you say, what have we spoken against you? You have said, it is useless to serve God. What profit is it 
that we have kept his ordinance and that we have walked as mourners before the Lord of hosts. So now we call the proud blessed, for those who do wickedness are raised up. They even tempt God and go free. Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another. As the Lord listened and heard them, so a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and who meditate on his name. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, on that day that I make them my people, my jewels, or my uh, special treasure, And I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. Then you shall again discern between the righteous and the wicked, between one who serves God and one who does not serve him. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, and all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly, will be stubble. And the day which is coming shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, that will leave them neither root nor branch. But to you who fear my name, the son of righteousness shall rise with healing in his wings, and you shall go out and grow fat like stall-fed calves. You shall trample the wicked, For they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day that I do this, says the Lord of hosts. Remember the Lord of Moses, my servant, which I commanded him in Horeb for all Israel. With the statutes and judgments, behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. Blessed be the name of the Lord and blessed be his word. Hallelujah. So the first section of our passage today brings in the eighth protest or complaint from the people. John mentioned this when he preached a few Sundays ago, that Malachi is is really a dialogue between the people of God who are moaning and groaning and complaining and God who gives replies. Or it's it's a dialogue. It's, you know, every one of the prophetic books is a bit different. And this is one of the the sort of things that makes Malachi different, among others as well. And here we have um, this this eighth and final protest. Um, It's a rebuttal of the charges that God is bringing against his people. All right? And let's look at that here. Your words have been harsh against me, says the Lord. Yet you say, and here this is it, this is the eighth rebuttal, what have we... What have we spoken against you? You have said, it is useless to serve God. What profit is it that we have kept his ordinance and that we have walked as mourners before the Lord of hosts? So now we call the proud blessed. For those who do wickedness are raised up. They even tempt God and go free. This is the self-deception that the people of God have got into on several accounts. You can see here there's an attitude of proudful entitlement. It's like, it's not worth it. It's not worth serving you, God, because the wicked are doing so well and we're doing so badly. (laughs) You know, we're the ones, or our ancestors, have paid such a price to come out from exile, back to Jerusalem, and look what we get. We're poor. We're not making much money. It's hard. 
life is tough here, and those that stayed <laughs> in Babylon are rich. They're doing very nicely. What about us? And friends, we can get into the same, exactly the same attitude of entitlement if we're not careful. And we can almost become envious of those in the world who seem to be doing so well. It's a deception. It's so short-sighted. God, give us your vision to see the end of the wicked and the glorious end of the remnant to, that hold on to you till the end, come what may. When I read this, I think about this, I think of Psalm 73. <laughs> Psalm 73. When the people of God, and, and the psalmist expresses the anguish and the frustration that the wicked seem to be doing so well. You know, everything's going well for the wicked. I almost became envious of the wicked until I entered the sanctuary of God. And then I understood their destiny. It's only in the sanctuary of God in the holy secret place where you are with God and he is with you that you can have the eyes of your heart enlightened and you can understand the final destiny of the wicked and the glorious destiny of the righteous. Praise God. We need to be living in that truth all the time because life is tough. Jesus never promised that discipleship would be a bed of roses unless you include the thorns. Hallelujah. Amen. There's another scripture in the New Testament that I think of when I, I think of the people of God, <laughs> myself included, sometimes tempted to moan and groan and complain. And that's James. James 4, 7. Submit to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Let me read that whole section to you. James 4, 7 to 10. In fact, let's read that quote from the Old Testament before. It says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Double-minded. Lament, mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. This is the New Testament, friends. Hallelujah. We're not... Well, the Bible's the same all the way through. Don't let anybody fool you who's, who says, oh, the God, you know, the God of the Old Testament's different from the... What? Tosh. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. Including us, including me. I can get so self-centered and not even realize it. Any of us have blind spots in the house? I do. We can so easily draw attention to ourselves. I, I mean, I'm convicted of it quite often. My lengthy prayers. My lengthy words. <laughs> we don't know we're doing it sometimes. It's almost as if a subconscious sense of need is being expressed. Only when we ponder it, we think, oh, actually, that's something I'm exposing myself. I'm, I'm showing that actually I'm not finding my completeness maybe in its fullness in Christ. And that's the way I express it, by saying too much or praying too, too I mean, I, I'm the first on the list. <laughs> okay, well, well, we'll have a confession later. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Praise God. You know, and friends, we need to consider our life orientation. We need to consider the priorities in our lives. What is it that makes us tick? What is it really that motivates us to live? All right, you, you gotta you, you gotta work, 
you, you know, that's okay. But you work for the Lord. You don't work for the NHS. Otherwise, you wouldn't survive, Janelle. I know. You wouldn't. Especially in your privileged position in A&E. Can you believe it? How, how many month, years have you worked there? Four years. The grace of God prevails. Let it continue. Amazing. Seek ye first, can't get away from this, words of Jesus. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all the other stuff will be added onto you when God knows you need it. Trust him. Get your heart right first. The orientation of your heart, the motivation of your, your soul. Seek God first in everything we do. So easy to be compromised and double-minded because we make allowances. And we think God, we are fooled to believe that God will make allowances for us. But it says earlier in that chapter 3 in Malachi that God is the God who doesn't change. He doesn't change. Sometimes we are fooled to think, well, God understands. He knows and I had a sleepless night. He knows this and that, what he does, but he doesn't make allowances for sin, for sloppiness, for bad habits that are depleting your focus on him. And so we can end up tolerating those habits, thinking they're okay, and not okay at all. We've all got them. We could have a confession time, couldn't we, Auntie Doreen? But you know, you know. But let's be serious. Those things are the little foxes that ruin the vineyards that are in bloom and we're not fruitful. Or what we have to offer to the Lord is meager. It's not the fullness of the bumper harvest that he wants to bring through our lives. We have to deal with those little foxes ruthlessly. Kill them. <laughs> There's no other way. Don't treat them as nice furry pets. They're not. So, submit to God. Resist the devil because he's involved in this more than you realize. And he's out to annihilate you. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. The implication there is that he, if you don't, he'll, he will come as close as he can. He'll, he'll start invading and infiltrating your soul if you don't submit to God and resist him. He's the enemy of your souls. We are in a spiritual warfare that is vicious and intense. Friends, the sooner we wake up to it, the better. Hallelujah. Cleanse your hands. That's what you do. You sinners, purify your hearts. That's your desires. Examine your heart before God. What are my desires, Lord? What do I really want? What are my heart's desires? Is it him and his kingdom? Or is it the things of this world? Praise God. Humble yourself and he will lift you up. Glory to God. Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord listened and heard them. So a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and who meditate on his name. Hallelujah. We talked about the fear of the Lord last time, I think. So I'm not going to repeat too much of that, except eight times in this little book, the fear of the Lord is mentioned. Interestingly, the last, the last prophet before the 400 years of silence, before John the Baptist came to the scene, eight times the fear of the Lord is repeated. And those who meditate on his name, hallelujah, or those who esteem his 
name. Praise God. This is a group that got together, that decided they were going to take God seriously, the remnant, and they were going to repent, and they were going to just respond to the word of the Lord. You know, names are important, especially in Hebraic culture and custom. The name of anybody carries the character and the destiny of uh, the carrier of the name. Hallelujah, the bearer of the name. When you meet somebody, the first thing you do is ask their name, usually. Yep, you, to know somebody's name um, is, is the first point of contact in establishing a relationship, isn't it? You need to know their name. And that's the same with God. How much more so with with God? Do you know what the Lord's name is? We sang it this morning. Well, we don't really know, actually. But Jehovah stands for Yahweh, yad heh vav Do you know how many times his name, this is his personal name. Do you know how many times... It's mentioned in Malachi. Forty-five times. That's a lot of times for a little book. Do you know what it means? It means something. It means I am who I am. Or I will be who I will be. We're singing, there's no name like Jehovah. I can't get the melody, sorry. Yeah, it's true. There's no one like Jehovah. Jehovah stands for, or Yahweh stands for the, the unutterable name of God. Just spelling out the consonants, yad He vav He, the four Hebrew consonants. It's the name revealed to Moses. You know, who shall I say sent me when I go to the elders of Israel? I am. I am that I am. The Jewish people don't even like to mention the name of God. They hold it with such reverence and awe. And they just say, Hashem, the name. That's enough. The name. Praise God. Do you know the first prayer in the Bible? Do you know where the first prayer is in the Bible? Genesis, of course. Has to be Genesis. <laughs> Correct. Genesis 4. Let me read it to you. Genesis 4, 26. And as for Seth, to him also a son was born, and he named him Enosh, Then men began to call on the name of the Lord. Or the mention mention of prayer, should I say. That's better. Maybe that's not actually the prayer, but it's it's the mention. Then men began began to call on the name, the name of the Lord. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Hallelujah. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. Friends, there is power in the name of the Lord. It's not a magic formula. But when you speak the name of the Lord with faith in who it is that you speak. God of heaven's armies. A Lord of hosts that's mentioned as the name of God 23 times in Malachi. Things change. Mountains move. Hallelujah. Do you meditate on the name of the Lord? Do you meditate on the name of the Lord? He has many names. About 250, I think. Hallelujah. 
I love his names. Shepherd, deliverer, rock, king, helper, jealous, faithful, true. Hallelujah. Meditate on the name of the Lord. He has so many lovely names. And we grow in our love and longing for him. And we're nourished as we do. Praise God. Verse 17. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, on the day that I make them my jewels or my treasured possession, my special treasure. And I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. Then you shall again discern between the righteous and the wicked, between the one who serves God and the one who does not serve him. Friends, a day is coming. It's called the day of the Lord, when there will be a great day of reckoning, a day of separation, the righteous from the wicked. God will make a distinction. He will separate those on his right from those on his left. But he desires, he desires for his own to be his jewels. I just want to, I think this is probably a quote from Deuteronomy 7, 6. Um, For you are a holy people to the Lord, your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the Lord and the earth. Thank you, sorry. Praise God for wives. Praise God for courageous wives that speak up when they need to. Amen. (laughs) You know, God's longing, he's he's a jealous God because he's jealous for a people, his treasured possession, his jewels that have been through the fire and the furnace and have been tested and refined. He's longing for a people so he can live with and reign with forever. Are you among them? Are we among them? Are we among the remnant that take his word seriously, who fear him, who honor his name and meditate on his names. Praise the Lord. Let's not be stubborn to change. Let's not be stuck in a rut. Let's not think we're okay. Let's not make allowances and accommodate those habits and tolerate them because they will, sooner or later, they will, they will lead you away from God. As things get tougher in the world, those things that you tolerated, that you thought were little and small, will come huge impediments. Chapter 4, for for behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, and all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly, will be stubble. And the day which is coming shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts. When I was a little boy... And we used to go for uh, holidays, summer holidays in Norfolk uh, in the summer. Sometimes you'd pass fields that had been harvested and the stubble was being burned. You're not allowed to do it anymore in this day of climate change. I'm not going to talk about that. But do any of you remember that the stubble used to be burnt in the fields? That's the image. gets burnt up. The day of the Lord. And it's mentioned again in verse 5. The great and dreadful day of the Lord. It's a settling of accounts. We talk in English, there's a kind of idiom, the day of the motor car, the day of the internal combustion engine, the day of whatever it is, McDonald's, I don't know. It's like the era the era. But a day is going to come when God has his way to the full, to the max. Nothing barred. And he's a jealous God. Jealous for you. Jealous for me. 
and he's furiously, his, his wrath, his wrath is going to boil over because he's a God of justice. You know, Peter took us to see a film a couple of weeks ago. What's it called? Sound of Freedom. Any of you seen it? You should see it. The people of God need to see this film. The very fact that you haven't heard of it tells you Hollywood kept the lid on this film for five years. I won't say anything more. It's, it's, yeah. It's about one of the things, one of the things that God is furiously, wrathfully angry about. I tell you. It's, we need to see that because we need to realize how close we are to the edge and that God's wrath, when it comes, will be fully justified. Of course it will be. But sometimes it helps just to know a little bit about some of the horrors that are going on. I'm sure the Lord shields us from most of it. But it's good just to know a little bit because we can be so easily mothballed in false comfort. The day of the Lord. The day of the Lord mentioned many times through the prophets and even in the New Testament as well. Let me just read three places in Scripture where the day of the Lord is mentioned. First of all, Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 18. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath. But the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy, for he will make speedy riddance of all those who dwell in the land. Whew. This is the word of the Lord. This is true. And let's look at Revelation 6, 15 to 17. Revelation 6, 15 to 17. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come and who is able to stand? No one save those who are hid in him under the shelter of his wings. Finally, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and 25. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. Let us consider one another in order to stir love and good works, or let us Consider how we can stir one another up to love and good deeds, not forsaking the assembly of the saints or of ourselves, as is the manner of some. In other words, don't stop meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but rather exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. Can anybody see the day approaching? I can. I can see it approaching fast. Let us consider how do we stir one another up to love and good deeds. I mean, let's do it. Very, very practical. When you get home today, you can sit on your own for five minutes and you think, how can I stir up Uncle Tony to love and good deeds? And does say, there's lots and lots of love and good deeds, Tony. Maybe somebody else. But it's very practical. Very practical. Do it. Who are you stirring up? Who are you provoking to love and good deeds? As you see that day of the Lord approaching rapidly. Amen. Right. The son of righteousness. Hallelujah. What a contrast. The son of righteousness will rise with healing in his wings. What a contrast to this furious burning oven to consume the proud who ignore God's warnings and words. They are trampled like ashes by the righteous and their destiny is a terrible one. But for those who fear my name, 
The son of righteousness will rise with healing in his wings. Hallelujah. The son sustains life. It gives life. Hallelujah. The reward of the humble. Glory be to God is to be hidden under the shelter and the shadow of his wings. This speaks of the most intimate, really, actually, the most intimate of relationship with God, the lover of our souls, our heavenly bridegroom. Glory to God. This word in Hebrew, wings, comes a few times in Scripture. It's the word kanaf. Well, it's from the word kanaf that also means corner. Praise God. Do you remember that uh, law in Numbers 15 where it says, You shall make tassels on the corners of your garments. Well, the tassels actually demonstrates righteousness. That's what the woman was trying to get at through the crowd. If I can only touch his righteousness, then I'll receive his healing. Mm, Maybe she knew her Bible. It actually, this was a commandment, not just for the priests, but for all Jewish men to wear these tassels on their garment. It demonstrated the priesthood of the whole nation, not just the the Levitical order. Praise God. You know, in Matthew 15, 35 and 36, it says, when they'd crossed over, they came to the land of Gennesaret, And when the men of that place recognized him, that's Jesus, they sent out into all the surrounding region. They brought to him all who were sick and begged him that they might only touch the hem of his garment, the corner of his garment. Hallelujah. And as many as touched it were made perfectly well. I love it. It wasn't just the woman There were many others that also strove to touch the edge, the corner of his robes. There was no magic in it, but it was faith. Faith in his righteousness. Because God's promises are true. If you as the people of God trust his promises, he will deliver. Glory to his name. Psalm 91. Many of you know this by heart. If you don't, learn it by heart. You're going to need it. He will cover you with his feathers and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. Hallelujah. He will cover you with his feathers and under his wings you will find refuge. As I said, this speaks of the most intimate of closeness with the Lord. What did Ruth say to Boaz on the threshing floor? Spread the corner to Boaz, who got the shock of his life. (laughs) Spread the corner of your garment over me, since you are a kinsman redeemer. This is the precursor of the hooper, the wedding canopy. In other words, she was proposing to him. (laughs) Interesting. Ezekiel 16.8 tells us, this is God speaking of his people in love. When I passed by you again and looked upon you, indeed your time was the time of love. So I spread my wing over you and covered your nakedness. Yes, I swore an oath to you and entered into a covenant with you, and you became mine, says the Lord God. Praise God. Wow. Has he spread the corner of his garment over you? Have you found shelter under the shadow of his wing? 
We need to in this day, this day that is coming, really do. Praise God. Let's move on. I'm not going to say too much about this next bit. Bjorn mentioned, uh, dealt with this pretty well when he, he preached a few Sundays ago. Remember the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded him in Horeb for all Israel. With the statutes and judgments, behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. Now, as you know, we mentioned this a few weeks ago. This is just too much to have at the end of the the Jewish Bible, if I could say it that, or the Hebrew scriptures. So actually they end with chronicles. But even when even in Malachi, they don't still don't end with that verse. But this the end of, it's it's the last part of our Bibles, and it's significant. It's significant. Yes, Bjorn talked about the turning of the hearts of the fathers to the children. And I just want to give a a couple of other dimensions of what I think that can also mean. I believe it can speak of the patriarchs. You know, we've had already in this book of Malachi, we've had um, Jacob, Levi, Moses, Elijah mentions, haven't we? They're what we call the fathers, the patriarchs. There are others. Abraham, Isaac, okay? The patriarchs, the fathers. Those through whom God's revelation first came. Personally, directly, powerfully. And then we have the children. Those that were born later. And even the children yet to believe. And I think one of the meanings of this this scripture is that God will restore and wants to restore and is appealing for the restoration of the original faith of the patriarchs to their descendants. Because those that Malachi preached to were not in the best of places. Which is why he had to bring this message. So that they had a chance to repent. And have their hearts turned to those of their forefathers and the the patriarchs. I also believe that this could mean that All children of faith, Jew and Gentile, have their hearts returned to the biblical roots of their faith. Because there's a a lot of churches, a lot of Christians out there who don't have much of a clue as to what really the roots of their faith. I'm talking about the Hebraic roots of their faith, understanding the covenants, Understanding actually the full and the com- more complete picture of God's redemptive plan and purpose. Because unless that happens, it's going to be very, very difficult. It's going to be very difficult. Lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. Or actually, the word curse there in the New King James Version, other, the, the ESV translates it, rightly, utter destruction. If this reconciliation is not going to happen, it's curtains. Because this is, this is the last hope, really, for anybody, is that we put our faith in the God of the Bible, the God of Israel. There's only one way to be saved, and that's God's way. Therefore, the next verse of the Bible is obviously in Matthew 1, 1. And if you have any 
pages in between you can rip them out. They don't belong in your Bible. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Hallelujah. Now you've got two of the patriarchs, two of those whose hearts need to be reconciled to the children. And it's only through Jesus Christ. And he was the one who bore the curse. It says in the law of Moses, that was referred to a few sentences earlier, anyone who hangs on a tree is cursed. Jesus was the one who took the curse. Do you see the symmetry? Do you see the spiritual equation here? The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Jesus came to fulfill the Davidic covenant. He'll fulfill that in his second coming when he rules and reigns from the house of David over all the nations of the earth, from Jerusalem. He fulfilled or is fulfilling the Abrahamic covenant that through your seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Hallelujah. Praise God. The son of righteousness will rise with healing in his wings. The Lord Jesus Christ is our son of righteousness. It's by his being a curse for us on the cross that we can avert the destruction of God and be healed and made whole. Hallelujah. You know, as I was reading this, thinking about this, there's one phrase perhaps sums up this message today, and that's, come out of her, my people. Come out of her, my people. It's kind of the last appeal, isn't it, in Revelation? Come out of her, my people. Don't share in her sins. Otherwise, you will also share in the wrath of God on that day, that day of the Lord. We need to separate ourselves. Just trying to, is it? It's 12. Okay, good. I'm, I'm nearly finished. I'm just going to return to the second verse of the first chapter because this is a hard message but it is spoken in love right at the very very start of this book God said I loved you says the Lord and then their first complaint we looked at the last complaint their first complaint was how have you loved us <laughs> but God has loved us Friends, we need to recalibrate our thinking and our expectation to the word of God that we can receive his love and his love and his rebuke and admonition that is spoken in love because he wants us to be his treasured jewels. Hallelujah. I'm going to give an appeal in a moment, but I'm going to read... I'm going to read something, and it, you might not understand this, and you might disagree with it quite strongly. I'm sorry about that. I'm not, I'm, not trying to, I'm not trying to bring division, but I read this earlier this week, and it really floored me. I mean, I'm not sure if that's the right word, but it convicted me deeply. Um, it's from the writings of Tozer, but the Lord spoke to me through this. And you, you may not understand exactly what's said here, but if you catch the, the spirit of this, um, I want to make an appeal to those that want to receive and respond to, to this. Okay. But if you're offended, I'm sorry. Should I be sorry? Perhaps not. Um, 
Okay, this, this is an appeal. This is an appeal. Everything in the New Testament accords with this Old Testament picture. Ransomed men need no longer pause in fear to enter the Holy of Holies. Amen. God wills that we should push on into his presence and live our whole life there. This is to be known to us in conscious experience. It is more than a doctrine to be held. It is a life to be enjoyed every moment of every day. Similarly, the presence of God is the central fact of Christianity. At the heart of the Christian message is God himself waiting for his redeemed children to push into conscious awareness of his presence. That type of Christianity, which happens now to be in fashion, knows this presence only in theory. It fails to stress the Christian's privilege of present realization. According to its teachings, we are in the presence of God positionally, and nothing is said about the need to experience that presence actually. What hinders us? The answer usually given simply that we are cold will not explain all the facts. There is something more serious than coldness of heart. What is it? What but the presence of a veil in our hearts, a veil not taken away as the first veil was, but which remains there, still shutting out the light and hiding the face of God from us. Self is the opaque veil that hides the face of God from us. It can be removed only in spiritual experience, never by mere instruction. We may well try to instruct leprosy out of our system. There must be a work of God in destruction before we are free. We must invite the cross to do its deadly work within us. We must bring our self-sins to the cross for judgment. We must prepare ourselves for an ordeal of suffering in some measure like that through which our Savior passed when he suffered under Pontius Pilate. Let us remember that when we talk of the rending of the veil, we're speaking in a figure, and the thought of it poetical, sorry, the thought of it is poetical, almost pleasant, but in actuality, there is nothing pleasant about it. In human experience, that veil is made of living spiritual tissue. It is composed of the sentiment, quivering stuff of which our whole being consists. And to touch it is to touch us where we feel pain. To tear it away is to injure us, to hurt us, and to make us bleed. To say otherwise is to make the cross no cross and death no death at all. It is never fun to die to rip through the dear and tender stuff of which life is made can never be anything but deeply painful. Yet that is what the cross did to Jesus, and it is what the cross would do to every man to set him free. Let us beware of tinkering with our inner life, hoping ourselves to rend the veil. God must do everything for us. Our part is to yield and trust. We must confess, forsake, repudiate the self-life, and then reckon it crucified. But we must be careful to distinguish lazy acceptance from the real work of God. We must insist upon the work being done. We dare not rest content with a neat doctrine of self-crucifixion. That is to imitate Saul and spare the best of the sheep and oxen. Insist that the work be done in very truth, and it will be done. The cross is rough, and it is deadly, but it is effective. It does not keep its victim hanging there forever. There comes a moment when its work is finished, and the suffering victim dies. After that is resurrection glory and power, and the pain is forgotten, for joy that the veil is taken away, and we have entered in actual spiritual experience 
the presence of the living God. Friends, if any of that chimes with you and you want to respond with me now, would you stand to your feet? And I will pray for us. Don't feel obliged. Don't stand unless you, are, you have some sense of what you want to get yourselves in for. Hallelujah. Oh, Father, Father, we want to be done with powerless Christianity. Because, Lord God, we are your children and your word is true. Because, Jesus, you died on the cross to set captives free. Because, Jesus, you died that men and women might not go to hell but be with you in, ev- for, in heaven forever. Father, we stand to our feet because we're desperate. We're desperate for the cross to work its work of crucifixion to our self-centered lives. Lord, lead us by the power of your spirit and your word into all truth and experience, Lord, that you might be all in all, in and through us. Father, this week, as we live our lives, help us draw near to you, that we might know you drawing near to us. Show us the trajectory of our journeys as your children with the cross to glory. And Father, make your appeal through us to those around us who are in desperate need of salvation. Jesus, without you, we can do nothing. Lord, have your way. Have us. Have us in totality, Lord. Take us, Lord. Take us and use us as you will, Lord, as your bondservants. In Jesus' name and for the love of God, amen. Amen.